All right, hello everybody. Uh, so today's lecture is gonna be on one of the legendary coaches in the gymnastics field, which is Valerie Kondos Field, who as you can see, uh, has been the head coach uh, for the UCLA gymnastics program for many, many, many years. Now, what we're gonna be looking at is actually her book. And I pulled some, some different interesting stories and things from her book that is called Life is Short, Don't Wait to Dance. And you know what? It's a really good title because what you're going to see throughout this presentation, hopefully, is she has a very disciplined style, but yet what she also tries to infuse with her athletes is what she calls joy and actually enjoying what you are doing. So why is that so important? Well, as she will discuss, that idea can kind of get beaten out of you the higher that you go. And especially when you're competing for national cha championships, which obviously UCLA is basically every season, you know, that kind of pressure can kind of erode that fun. So with her background, what I found really interesting, and she's coached seven national championships, four time coach of the year. She actually did not grow up as a gymnast, okay? She was a ballet dancer. Uh, and so when you're really thinking about understanding a sport, being able to be one of the top coaches, when you actually didn't do that sport growing up, I, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting backstory and you just don't see that quite often. But what she's been able to do and what we will see is she's been able to do develop an understanding of the sport and then also really earn the respect and admiration from each of the athletes that work underneath her. Now, one of the quotes that I thought was, was interesting that kind of stuck out uh, to me was, during the run for her sixth national championship, the goal of the gymnastics team was to try to hit 24 of 24 routines throughout their whole team. Now, obviously when we talk about this, that, that idea of striving for perfection is wonderful. And she talks about going after perfection, but not necessarily becoming a perfectionist, but that was their goal. And what she said afterwards, because they hit them, was we hit our goal and the championship was a bonus. Now, how many coaches is it the championship is the number one goal and everything else underneath comes from that? Well, her goal with that team was let's master and really dominate each of our routines, okay? And if we are able to do that, we focus on the process, well, the result of winning the championship will just happen. And where have we heard that model of thinking and that approach as a coach? Well, certainly we've heard that from Coach John Wooden. Now, it is not an accident also that she embodies many of the same philosophies that Coach Wooden did. And that is because they were actually very, very close throughout her time in Los Angeles. And so what she said is when you put winning above people, you open up your organization to a corrosiveness that can spread like a cancer. And so a lot of her ideas came from these conversations that she would be having with John Wood. And so one of the interesting aspects um, that she had with, with uh, Coach Wooden was she had a lot of team meetings and John Wooden has very few team meetings. And so in her mind, she's thinking, okay, maybe I'm making a mistake here. You know, obviously Coach Wooden, he knows what he's doing. He did it this way. Why am I doing it the opposite? And so she went and talked to him about it. And what Coach Wooden said was, you know, it's okay because you need to go with what your gut feel is. How I coached my team and coach males may be different than your coaching philosophy and coaching females. And so he started to try to get her to trust her instinct as a coach instead of just, what does this coach do? And that's what I need to copy and that's where I need to go with it. Now this relationship though was a lot of give and take on both sides because even the great John Wooden had regrets. And it was fascinating because we, we talk about obviously the wooden pyramid and it is just a pinnacle um, in the sport and coaching world. And Wooden actually said he regretted not including the word love within his pyramid. And what she was able to offer back to him was, you know what, if you don't include or 
even though it's not in the pyramid, if you don't have love present with what you are doing, that's going to come across to the athletes and none of the blocks that you have in that pyramid would be achievable. And so it's something that hit home with wooden too is, okay, that's kind of an ever present idea and that's just going to come across with how much you care. And that is certainly something that she wanted to embody within herself as a coach going forward. Now she talked about four different coaching styles that she has seen and kind of come across. And I like how she even uh, chooses to phrase this chapter in her book, which is called choosing to motivate, choosing to motivate. And so it's a choice in how you want to approach things as a coach. And again, a lot of coaches, they get so used to the job that it kind of beats them down and they forget this idea of it is a choice to be a coach. And again, how you, if you were seeing it that way, that's going to ab absolutely feed into the way that your philosophy and, uh, and everything that you do. So the first coaching style she addresses is what's called the defeatist. These are pessimists and they're cheerless, they're uninspired. And she says they can actually have some success, but any success that they achieve is just coincidental because you are there. And so these are the kind of coaches um, or people, you know, that you know that they show up at, yeah, the obligations, the practices, maybe they have a few required office hours, that's what they do. But they're always going to kind of do the minimum, and that's just the way that they approach things in general. And now what you'll also hear from people like this is they don't pay me enough to want to put more in this job. Maybe if we had a bigger budget, we'd do better, blah, 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 blah. And it's all these defeatist ideas, pessimistic ideas. Uh, and so if you have a coach who this is the way that they think, you're not going to inspire people. You're not going to be able to bring out the best in others. And so what she says is most of the people like this, they'd probably be happier in other professions because coaching is just not something you're going to be able to do successfully for a long time if this is how you're going to approach it. Now, another style that she discusses is this narcissist. And what she says is a, a really obvious way to tell if this is kind of how a coach is approaching this is what you're going to hear is well it's my team or my athletes my program i've heard a lot of athletes from you know every different level discuss the ideas of well this coach kind of wants to put their stamp on me or on their program and so that's what they can always say okay no matter how successful i am i was able to put this little stamp on the player and if that's really how a coach is going to approach things again it's really more about the coach than actually being a coach and helping the athlete. So her approach was always that it is UCLA's team, it is not my team. And she even you know, goes as far as, she calls all of her athletes Bruins. She never says ladies. So it's really you know, the identity concept, making sure that she understands it's the athletes first, it is the team and it's not about her. And she even talks about this one example where uh, she was on campus and there was a male team of UCLA's. And so all the, uh, her team, they were sitting there eating breakfast and the male team was in line waiting for their food. And the head coach comes down of the male team and looks at the players, cuts the line and says, hey, good morning, ladies. And it was one of these little moments that, you know, you may not think much of, and maybe the, the players on that team, they're just used to it, so they didn't even think anything of it. But to her, it was like, you know, this is probably why you're not winning as much as you could. You're just constantly kind of undercutting your players, you know, no pun intended there. And what she says is it sends this message when you talk to your athletes like this, that you're not really worthy of my attention unless you were actually competing well. And so for her, yes, she wanted to win like everybody, but that was not her overriding philosophy and what you will, you will see. And so a lot of narcissists, that's really what it will, it's completely about winning. It's me and I need this because it's a reflection of who I am. You hear a lot of bad parents, the same idea. They are driven by this idea of, okay, my kids are a reflection of me, all ego. It's not about helping the children. It's actually just about making myself look good. That's what a lot of narcissists, when that's your overriding style, that's how they approach things. Now the strategist, she says, these are our coaches who focus on the fundamentals 
of the actual game itself. And usually these are gonna be people who, they love the sport and they're constantly thinking about it. They're constantly drawing up different plans. They're trying to create new strategies and different philosophies. How do I do this? You know, what can I draw up on the board you know, that hasn't been done before? And they're always, as she says, kind of working from a clipboard or their whiteboard or watching film. And if you've played sports, you know, you can probably identify some of the coaches like this. Now, one of the examples that she uses is Coach Al Skates, who is the UCLA men's volleyball coach. And he has won 19 championships, so pretty successful. But one of the, the interesting strategies that he uses with his team is what's called the curtain. And the way that his teams practice is they have this curtain set up where the top 16 players on the team are allowed to practice on the court with the head coach. And the bottom 10 practice on the other side of the curtain with their assistant coach. Now you hear this and it's like, okay, that doesn't sound like it would create good chemistry. It's a kind of a, a different approach. May not work in all sports and with every kind of team. But for him, this is what he wanted to do because in his mind, it creates Darwinism and strong minds. And one of the interesting things that she pointed out and that he points out too, is there were two athletes who actually never made it past the curtain in college. They were always in the bottom 10, but they got so used to just this idea of a strong-minded athlete, I'm not gonna allow it to defeat me. I love my sport, I'm gonna keep playing that these two players actually really started to blossom after college and they went on to the Olympics and played in the Olympics. Okay. Even, you know, above the division one UCLA team. So it's just something that has worked for him. And I thought it was a really interesting philosophy. And she kind of, uh, she says it comes from this idea of a competitive cauldron, which I came from this old famous coach named Anson Durant. And, and uh, what, this philosophy was where they tracked team stats. So basically everything that you do, whether it's comments you make, how much sleep did you get? Uh, how are your interactions and practice, your energy level, just every possible thing that they could figure out to track. They would do. And what they would do is put these results in front of the team. So you were essentially everything you do was always hands on deck and you were, again, it was creating competition for you, not just in how you approach practice, but in all aspects of your life. And again, you know, yes, we want to win and yes, we want to develop people, but creating competitive instincts is one of the best things that a coach can do. Because if you can do that and you can weed out that fear instinct, well now, guess what? Now you're creating a person that, whether they're an athlete or not, they are going to succeed at probably everything that they do. That's why she says all great coaches are these strategists. Now, what her strategy is based on this, this idea of the curtain and the, the cauldron is what she would do often in practice is have the team get warmed up and then they would actually rank their warmups. Then based on the structure of this ranking, you could then compete against the person who was either like before or after you to try to move up that ranking system. And so a lot of times they would get warmed up and then they would have like head to head competitions and battles. And it was something that a lot of the athletes have fun with. Yes, it breeds competitiveness. And it's just something that again, kind of wires the brain to think in the proper way. And so it's something she really liked to do. And she always did with her teams. Now, the last strategy or style she talks about is this altruist. And she says, these are the, the kind of people who they're mentors, they're selfless, they want to take care of other people. They usually will take the high road in arguments. And really, it's about helping other people over their own comfort and uh, over, excuse me, over their own comfort and ego. And so it's really about developing trust. And she says, you know, she believes that she is an altruist. And so that is a great personality trait to have. But she says, I had to learn how to be a strategist because no matter how much you care about people, you've also got to know the sport too. And especially with her background, not being a gymnast growing up, she had to develop that style. And so what she says is, this is kind of why I hire multiple styles so that 
the whole, you know, coaching staff has different, you know, strengths and areas that they can bring to the table to kind of match each other. And Josie says the perfect coach is a combination of a strong strategist and altruist and even a narcissist. And she says, as long as a coach has a strong acumen for the sport, a good plan, then that ego, which can be some, sometimes helpful, won't get in the way. And so as long as that ego is kept secondary, again, it's gonna bring about confidence for you, which is what you need to perform too. And again, if you really wanna be successful, you do need to have a bit of an ego. It's just, you can't let that ego be the dominant trait that you have. So I really like how she breaks down a lot of these different coaching styles um, and started to dive into kind of what she has seen, who she thinks she is, and then what also, you know, how important it is to develop again, a staff that has multiple perspectives and you don't you want to just have one style that the um, the entire staff embodies now i'd like you to listen to a little bit of this video and it's about her program and she's going to talk about her philosophy and how it's developed and we're even going to talk a little bit about some of the athletes um, or with the athletes as well about their perspective on her as a coach I am a very strong advocate in the fact that we never want to take the joy out of learning anything. And joy isn't fun. Joy is that inner pride that comes from accepting a challenge and working really hard at it. I shifted a few years ago from the classic gymnastics floor routines to more relatable fun floor routines. Our floor routines are not that well respected internationally in the elite world, but it is proven to be exactly what college needed. Numbers, fan bases are through the roof. They're bigger than better than ever before. I've been doing gymnastics since I was three years old. It wasn't necessarily that the Olympics was the goal ever, but that's kind of what was placed in front of me because that's what my talents were capable of. If I had a back injury and shoulder surgeries and it shifted to college gymnastics, my goals after that because my body just couldn't handle anything else. When you're a gymnast, you peak when you're 16 years old. So if you kind of don't make that cut off for the Olympics, like chances are like the Olympics probably <laughs> isn't in your future. I had to give up like what ifs a long time ago and really fall in love with what I'm doing now and college gymnastics made it so easy. I came to UCLA to be their choreographer and their dance coach. They offered me the head coaching job. In my mind, a coach was tough-minded, relentless. They had all these coaching quips and phrases like go hard or go home and I was horrible and our team was not good but I realized I had been trying to be somebody else so I just went back to my roots and I thought what do I bring to the table having had 17 years of classical ballet training and I'll never forget a few years after that uh, one of my seniors said Miss Val you have finally become a leader worth following because you are being authentic and true to yourself. I coach the person who is the athlete. I don't just coach the athlete. I look at them as a comprehensive whole human being and I work to develop them to be the best they can be in all of those areas, not just gymnastics skills. I used to wonder like why we continue to go when we know it's kind of over after this, but I think that's almost the beauty of it all when you realize that you can't take anything in life for granted because it's not forever. This is it.
legacy Miss Val has created here has developed a culture where it's saying it, but it's like she's master not winning. People still came and supported and we didn't have to win to be seen. When we redefine success, where it's not all about winning, we will have healthier young adults. And this was a really important thing for her of developing athletes into adults versus developing them into winners. And again, you develop someone into an adult, they think the proper way, they're probably going to win more just thinking that way. But when it's emphasized so much, winning, you know, it, a lot of times, again, as she says, it takes kind of that joy away from your competing at your sport and having fun because it just adds pressure. And so it's just a really creative way that was true to her style. And she was able to figure out, okay, how do I really want to be as a coach as opposed to, again, look at all these successful coaches and how can I copy what they have done? And so she, as she says in this video, she started to find really who she was. And that's really when she started to blossom as this coach. And one of the cool things, again, that you, know, you just kind of saw in the video and she talks about, and I thought, I love this photo because you obviously have the athlete here who's having a blast, it looks like. But look at the team behind her. They're all up there. They're all smiling. They're all celebrating. They're all having a really good time. I think that that's a really important concept to understand. And again, it shows you this culture that she has continued to develop. Now, that does not mean that she does not also have certain disciplined concepts as a coach, as all the great coaches do. So what were her team rules? Well, early is on time and on time is late. We've heard that one before. No phones at team meals. So she wanted, again, all of her athletes to be talking and looking at one another as opposed to staring at their phones. Uh, no gum was allowed <laughs> ever. And she said, you know, it's kind of a habitual thing that you start to develop, you get used to chewing. It leads to other things and nail biting, et cetera, in her mind. So no gum. She also did not want any hair ties on, on uh, the wrists of her athletes. And she says, well, the reason is it's not that it's that bad of a thing, but you get so used to it, it becomes almost like a watch and it's part of your outfit. And so she would say, you know, she'd be seeing uh, some of her athletes, they're dressed up, they're doing job interviews, you know, they're doing important things and they have that wristband right around their wrist. And it just is something that in her mind does not come across as, as professional. So she just kind of wants to eliminate it. And it's just one of her own little rules. Now she also says, I don't want sweatpants dragging on the ground. And she talked about really, it, it, it's like when the athlete early in the morning at, is walking over to the facility and you're wearing big baggy pants, well, it could be dragging on the ground, you're bringing dirt, it's uncleanly. And it's just something that again, kind of goes to this way that you're going to approach things, especially when you are coming into the gym. And she just wanted that certain image of everyone, okay, this is how we're going to do it. Um, and again, she was kind of a clean freak about this. Now she says no belly or cleavage showing when you're traveling. So she um, certainly wants a certain look uh, when we would travel. I know when our baseball team would travel, we would wear suits. And that's the way that the, the coach wanted everyone to look. And so every kind of coach has their own traveling rules in terms of what they want this appearance to, to look like to those people they come in contact with. Uh, she said no bows ever in her hair. So she says it's for young girls to kind of do this thing and it's not for adult women. And again, she's trying to develop people into better young adults as opposed to, again, feeding into childlike behaviors. And then she says one other thing is no face tattoos. And uh, I don't think she was meaning the uh, Mike Tyson permanent tattoo on your face. I think she's uh, talking about here, um, even just the temporary tattoos you see in competitions and things like that. Uh, it's just something she does not want. Um, and again, in her opinion, does not reflect a mature adult. So she kind of does some of these things that Again, these are important to her and it started to build this culture. Now, going back to, okay, how does she get through to these athletes? Well, 
every year she says we have this talk and it's called now the Val's circle of life and what she does is she lays out in her mind the six most important things for a college student and a college athlete and she says number one morning gymnastics training going to class studying nutrition socializing and sleep and so these are these six core ideas that she says if you want to be a successful athlete this is kind of what your life has to be about now what she does though is she brings up an example in a circumstance that the girls on the team may run into okay so what her example is are you're winding down you're getting ready to go to bed you know you need to be up early she goes you have a 6 30 training room appointment the next day and as she says hot football guy all of a sudden sends you a text hey you want to go to in and out and it's 11 o'clock at night now of course you want to go but the question is here's your dilemma do you say no even though you want to go or do you go to sleep which you know you should do now the thing is and i put the picture up here they have an in and out on campus it's not even that far i mean there's life goals right there and i don't even know how this came across but i, I ended up finding um, this image with UCLA of all these different restaurants, I believe, that are from the area. Now, personally, of course, in and out that's always going to win for me. Didi Reese's is pretty good, I'm not going to lie. But, I mean, if you're from California, if you're from SoCal especially, I mean, in and out is the way to go, absolutely. But let's look at the chain reaction if you decide, all right, I'm just going to go out to dinner with this guy and hang out for a couple hours. So she says, all right, so you're going to eat some fries and you're going to get back to your dorm room at 1 a.m. And yeah, you didn't have a full meal, but you did eat fries. And so now let's look at what that rest of the night is going to be. Well, now you've got 200 unwanted calories that are going to eliminate the workout you did that day. And you're going to get a max of what, four hours of sleep now, basically. So now, instead of kind of going through your morning routine, you've got enough sleep. Now what's going to happen? Well, you're going to jump up out of bed at the last second. You're going to hit snooze button. You probably aren't going to have breakfast. And now you're going to roll into practice early. Now you're going to be tired. You're going to be cranky. You're going to be slow. And you most likely are going to have a poor practice. Now, even though your body was there, your mind was there, were you actually present and getting the most out of that time? Well, I would say that that's debatable, as she would. Now, she then says, all right, so you're at practice, you're gonna have these fake high fives, you're not gonna even have the energy, not only for yourself, but part of what I expect is your energy to help other people when you come into the gym. And that is one of her philosophies is you need to come into the gym no matter how you're feeling with energy and excitement. And that's the, the, the culture she really wants to build. And if you come in exhausted, you didn't eat, well, there's no way that you're gonna be able to have that same energy level. So then, now practice is over, you're gonna to go to class. You're not gonna pay attention either, even though you're, again, you're gonna be in class. You're gonna be there, but you're not gonna be learning. Then maybe after class, well now, instead of actually getting uh, your lunch, because hey, your nutritionist makes it for you. Oh, I forgot to grab that. How often does that happen? You didn't get sleep and you forgot something simple. Well, now you're gonna to go to Jamba Juice, add more sugar to your, to your diet, and you're just in this brain fog for the rest of the day. And so then what's gonna happen later that day, oh, now that same hot football guy is gonna ask you out, you're gonna to wanna to say yes, and then the cycle just continues. And so what her point is, one small decision, one lapse in judgment, how it will affect your next decisions. And so she talks about a lot of these different examples of how one little thing can impact what you do that next day the next week and so on and so forth and she says listen if you just said no that night if you just said no even though you want to go well this is what she thinks will happen well now the guy's going to be more interested in you because you're independent you have goals and aspirations and the discipline to achieve them and you sent the message that you don't need him which makes you that much more attracted to him it's a win-win for you. So again, it's about treating people as a human being versus the athlete. And again, so much of, again, if you were in college sports is you're probably good enough at the sport, even though you're gonna get better. Really though, it's all the life stuff that starts to happen. And so this is a really good example of what she, she tries to again, 
get her athletes to understand. Now, she also talks about in this one chapter, unplugging from fear, these ideas of FOMO and FOPO. FOMO, fear of missing out. FOPO, fear of other people's opinions. And, you know, again, like most people, she understands the more we stare at our phones, it's, it's an anxiety response, essentially. And what we know from having, you know, fear of missing out, which so many of us do, we feel this need to constantly be looking at our phone. What did I miss? What did I see? What did I not get? Did I get an email or did somebody text me? Whatever it is. Well, what this does is it increases anxiety. It increases depression. It becomes the anxiety response okay, not just about boredom, and there's actually a term that has been developed that's called nomophobia, and it's basically referencing no mobile phone phobia, and what she does is when she goes, she has the circle of life talk, and then she asks them at this retreat, and you can see a picture of the, uh, you know, one of the retreats here. Let's say we're up at camp for five days, and I told you that you will not have your phone. You cannot look at it. When you got back from those five days, would you look at today's social media activities or would you now go back over the last five days to see what you missed? And what were the answers of all the athletes? They all said, well, we would go back and try to see what we missed out on, what you know, were texts and what were emails and all these different things that you know, I would have been able to check up to the second, but I couldn't. And so she says, what this reflects is you just can't be present as an athlete. And if you can't do that, you're always going to be increasing your anxiety simply because you're worried about what you're missing out on all the time. And she says, one of the sports psychologists that she has worked with and works with the team at UCLA, you know, and I love this quote, it says, a person will never see themselves in running water. It is only when the water is still that their reflected image will begin to emerge. And so when you're so caught up in what you're missing or what is happening around the world and all that stuff, it creates a brain that just is very, very hard to stay present, hard to focus, and again, hard to just enjoy what you are doing. And so it's a really good question that she asks them to again, get through to that human side of them to help them understand this. Now, what she also has them do is Take what is called an Enneagram personality test. Now, she actually went to a sports psychologist and she said, we hadn't won a championship in five years. And, you know, those are life goals, of course, right? So she went to the sports psychologist and she says, we haven't won. And I needed to see if I was the reason for this. What is going on? And so the sports psychologist said, well, why don't you take this Enneagram test about what your personality is? And what it's looking at is, what is kind of your default? You know, how is your automatic instinctive response going to be depending on the situation you're put into? And that's what this personality test tries to examine. So some of these, these traits, there's nine different ones that I'm gonna kind of go through. She started to discover again who she was but then she was also starting to see, okay, I can kind of put a lot of these athletes into essentially these, these personality categories and understand where they are coming from. So number one is the reformer. This is the perfectionist where I need to be perfect. You know, you're an idealist, you're motivated, you're driven, you work hard. But if you feel that you need to be perfect, again, and this is something that's very present in the gymnastics world, well, it's again going to create a really beaten down and burnout mindset eventually. And that's just something that it helps you drive to success, but it is also a double-edged sword where it can bring you down. And I've been around many, many people and athletes who are wired in this manner and they just can't find a way to get out of it. Now, number two is the helper. This is a need to kind of be needed by other people. They're upbeat, they're energetic, they are friendly, and they will even, you know, willing to sacrifice themselves for others. But if you really think about being an elite athlete, while this is nice as a human being, this kind of personality isn't necessarily going to lead to that much success because you're always gonna put yourself aside. And you do, again, you need to have some form of ego 
if you want to be able to have a performance brain and bring out the best in yourself. So neither of these, again, are going to necessarily lead to the best performance as an athlete. Number three, the achiever. This is the person who they need to succeed and they just kind of make things look easy. And I'm sure every one of you knows somebody like this where whatever they do, it just kind of comes easy to them naturally. Now, the thing is about these kinds of people, and she says Jordan Weaver was one of them, a world-class gymnast. They're very image self-conscious and their goals are usually built around trying to create an image of success for other people. And so what happens is their identity becomes really wrapped up in what they do, because what is it? It's a way to make others essentially like you and think that you are successful. So it's not necessarily intrinsically motivated. It's much more extrinsically motivated where you're trying to prove something to others. And if that is again your goal, this is where identity issues can come into play, even though you probably are gonna be very, very successful. Now the individualist, this is someone who they need to be special, they're highly sensitive, they're usually gifted artistically, but these are people who are afraid of conflict. And you know they will usually only work hard when they really feel like they're connected to something that is gonna make them seem special and different. But if, again, if you cannot handle conflict, and again, it goes back to that competitiveness idea, that is not something that is going to help you in a competitive sport. It may help you as an artist, but not necessarily as an athlete. And so it's, again, you gotta understand that transformation of ideas. Now the investigator, she says, this is kind of this need to perceive everything. You're always constantly observing. Um, and a lot of these people, you know, they're, they love to people watch, right? They're always seeing what others are doing and then they behave their behaviors on this. And so a lot of people, she says, they live in their own heads and they're kind of detached from their emotions because again, they're always not thinking from themselves. They're thinking from another person's perspective and what's going on in that, their head. The loyalist, she says, they need security. They're very cooperative. They're good team players. They're really loyal in relationships. And the way that these people experience fear though, is for a need for protection and friendship. So usually they're gonna be very loyal and they're gonna be team oriented, but this is also gonna create some anxiety as well within this personality. Now, number seven and eight, these are important. She says, number seven, the enthusiast. It's a person who they have this need to strive to avoid pain and experiencing pain in their lives emotionally. She says, usually they're gonna be idealists and that is kind of how a way that they, again, feel part in this world is, okay, I see the world for what it is, but I believe that it's gonna be better. And they, again, create these visions. And essentially what they do is they imagine a better reality in their mind. Now, what she says is that these are good because usually these are athletes that wanna work hard, but the thing is they're always excited for like the next best thing. So they'll be doing like one task and they'll be doing one drill and they're already asking, hey, what's the next drill that we're gonna do? What's the next thing we're doing later? And again, good mindset, but it hurts the individual because they're always worried about what's next and they're not necessarily valuing the moment right now and getting the most out of that current drill. And so she says they're really fun to have on teams, but as a coach, these kinds of athletes are gonna require some extra attention to kind of keep on the current task. Now she says number eight is a challenger. And this is this need to kind of be competitive and go against people. You're not, you're not gonna be fearful or back down from competition. Usually you're gonna be very strong. And you're also somebody who you wanna play by the rules and you don't like dishonesty and injustice. And what she says is most of the athletes that come through the UCLA program are these sevens and these eights. And so again, if you understand your athletes and the personalities that a lot of them are gonna have once they get to that level, well, now you can kind of pinpoint or how do I need to help them and how can we develop this? And so it's a really useful way to understand and view athletes. Now, the last one is this peacemaker. She says it's a need to kind of avoid conflict. You always kind of accept what other people are doing and you wanna feel accepted by others. 
but you don't necessarily have your own goals and agenda. It's just to avoid conflict. And again, that's not something that is necessarily going to help you as an athlete, especially when you are on a team. And so it's about breeding this competitiveness. So what she says is, Val says, I am actually a two. That is my personality style. But she says, again, many of the Olympians that have come through the program, most of them were threes. And so go back to what that three was, the achiever. Work really hard, things come easy, but again, very goal-oriented, trying to make others think a certain version of you, and you are very connected with that identity concept. So usually you're going to see very, very successful, but you're also, again, going to potentially see burnout and identity issues that come along with these athletes. And what she says is most of them, you know, at that level, again, you make it to the Olympics, you're going to have to be kind of wired this way. They're very goal oriented and they want to plan everything and they want to know plans at all times. And I've had many students like this where they need to know everything about every second that the lecture is going to be on or five lectures from now or the schedule. They just want to know everything. And it's a really good thing to want to be able to plan. But again, as a skill, sometimes what you have to understand if you're wired this way is sometimes you're just going to have to roll with it and trust and not need to know every little detail. And sometimes that need to know every little detail can kind of suck away the fun and the instinctiveness that can just kind of happen from being in that present moment. So what she has had come through her program is just this series of incredible, incredible athletes. She said Caitlin Ahashi, Jordan Weber, Madison Koshin, Lori Hernandez, Nastya Lukin, Kyla Ross, and oh, perhaps the greatest gymnast of all time, Simone Biles. Now, Simone could not compete for UCLA because guess what? The NCAA rules prohibited that, but she obviously went on and, and pretty much dominated the entire Olympics and you can see her gold medals there. But really what you see is success comes through her program. And again, she has this wooden philosophy of winning is not the most important thing, but we're going to develop you and we're still going to win a lot because of it. And I just think, you know, it's a great philosophy to have as a coach. And, you know, I really enjoyed learning a little bit about her and how she approaches things. And you can just see kind of the joy in a lot of her athletes um, when they are performing. And I think that that's a really unique characteristic that she's been able to build with this culture. So what I'm going to have you guys do for your portfolio assignment is number one, you're actually going to take this Enneagram test. And I put up the, um, the link for you guys where you can just click on that. You can take the test pretty quickly. And what you're going to do is you're going to answer these two questions. Which personality trait does this test say you are most closely associated with? And then do you agree with this test assessment? And then why or why not? And then what I'd also like you to do after learning a little bit about Coach Val is she gave a wonderful TED talk, okay? And I put up, excuse me, sorry about that. I put up the TED talk here for you. You can see the link and I've even put it on Canvas as well. And I would like you to listen to this TED talk where she's gonna talk about defining success and winning. And I want you to kind of reflect on her discussion. And I wanna kind of just see what hits home from it and what can you take from this and include either in your philosophy or how do you, or what can you take from it and just really apply to all coaches um, and take her advice. And really, how do you think what she says can help impact today's athletes, but also the future generation of athletes as we evolve into this sport world? Because her philosophy and her approach is again, different from a lot of old school coaches. And so again, I would say she's a new school coach and she's part of this new generation um, in terms of being more player friendly and less fear driven um, as well. So uh, I hope that you guys enjoyed learning a little bit about her and a little bit about the gymnastics um, approach. Um, and again, if you have any questions about anything, certainly feel free to reach out to me. Uh, but other than that, have a wonderful weekend and I will see you guys soon. Take care.